What a privilege it is to be able to be with you and to serve in the Word of God. Lord, right now I pray for the presence of God, the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Lord, minister in my spirit, in my heart, that I would see, speak words that would, would build us, strengthen us, and help us, Lord, to, to genuinely be the people of God in this day, in this community, in the name of Jesus. Well, glory to God. I'm, I've got to say I'm excited about being here, and uh, uh, we've already talked about the election coming in two days. You've been exhorted and encouraged, and I just want all of you to know that my wife and I have already voted. So the winning team's already got, you know, we, we got it going the right way. Got our votes in. Uh, I don't quite go along with Mayor Daly, who said vote early and vote often, but I do believe in voting early. <laughs> all right. So uh, the title of my message... And would somebody close the door so nobody can leave? Uh, uh, the title for my message is uh, Trusting God in Biden Times. Um, so that may be a most unusual title, and, and somebody said, don't say it too often. Just, you know, anyway. Um, my goal is that we would actually hear from God by His Spirit that in the days we're living in, and I know that because of the president that we have, we have experienced things in this nation that have been very difficult, troubling in, in a variety of ways. Uh, and we need to be the people of God in this kind of a day. So may I remind you that when I talk about trusting God in Biden times, um, the Bible was written in what times? In Roman times. And they didn't vote in those days. You didn't have a voice. Uh, they had the authority and the power to put to death whoever they wanted to. Uh, there was a lot of persecution for the early church. So everything about the New Testament is written in a time when politically uh, it was difficult and, and knowing how to just make it alive was, was a pretty big deal. Uh, when I was thinking about this, this title and, and particularly about awareness of what's going on in our day, uh, I realize I was, I was born in the early part of the Second World War. Wasn't old enough to really know what's going on, but I've read enough to know that, uh, that being a Christian and learning how to walk with God and trusting God in war times was a very, very unusual and unsettling experience. Uh, the Bible talks about the end times, uh, what it's going to be like then, and that is a unique story. Over the years, over the centuries, we have had hard times, sometimes because of famines, sometimes because of storms, and uh, I, I've, I've studied history, and, and I'm thinking, what would it have been like in Europe during the Inquisition? The Catholics were uh, primarily the ruling uh, church of the, of the European Christianized world, and they had some principles that were biblically around, but the point is until 1400s and 1500s, when the Bible was translated into the language of the people, uh, nobody really understood much of what was in the Bible because there was primarily, uh, and even as the Catholics did until about the 70s, 1970s, uh, their, their messages were in Latin, and nobody spoke Latin, and so it's like you never really could get much out of any of that. When the Bible was translated into English and into German and languages like that in Europe, almost everybody that was involved in the translating ended up dying either by being burned at the stake or tortured in a very cruel manner just for, for translating the Bible. So we are recipients here some hundreds of years later. We grew up with Bibles. How many of you grew up in a home where there was a Bible? How many of you did not grow up in a home where there was a Bible? You did not, all right? Uh, most of you did. How many of you grew up in a home in which there were at least two or three Bibles? How many presently have at least 10 Bibles in your house? Uh, do you see what I'm saying? We are people greatly privileged because we've got the Word of God teaching us a whole lot of things about the principles of God, but the price that was paid by the people who translated was a huge, huge deal. All right, so we're, we're living in a, in, a, in a difficult time. The price of gas and the price of groceries, and a lot of things are difficult. Uh, by the way, just to help you get the picture, uh, in Europe, 
right now, because of the war going on with what the Russians are doing in Ukraine, has so impacted Europe that uh, many of the countries of Europe, especially the northern half uh, of, of Europe, in the winter season, they are, they are really fearfully looking forward to a time when there will not be enough fuel to, for them to heat their houses. Uh, they have been for some time now going out and cutting trees down in order to find wood that they can use during the winter just to survive. And whatever else you might hear about people trying to uh, talk to us about climate change and heat, the fact of the matter is cold and frost kills more people than heat does. And it's going to be very, very serious in, in Europe. And we too are paying a price for the things that are going on uh, with, with the Russia-Ukraine story. And uh, uh, it's not an easy thing. In fact, when it comes right down to it, uh, what I really could be and should be talking about is trusting God in uncertain times. All right? Trusting God in uncertain times. We have been spoiled. We've lived our lives, I did, going to schools where the trustees of the school were Christians and we were allowed to have Christmas programs and do things that would just, you know, openly declare our faith in God. And, and in my day growing up, some of you are younger than me and don't know that part, but in my day, the people that did not go to church wanted to send their kids to Sunday school because they said, that's where you're going to be taught the things I want my kids to have. Yeah. That's a culture that's kind of drifting away. We don't have that currently going on quite the same way, but we have been spoiled because we get to vote. We have freedom to do a whole lot of things, and when things kind of go hard, we're thinking, hey, wait a minute, somebody's taking away my rights here or what, whatever's going on. And uh, what I want to do, actually, is I want to address the whole talk, topic about how do we genuinely go about trusting God in uncertain times, in hard times, or at the present time, in Biden times, all right? Uh, so let me begin by going over to the book of uh, um, Second, no, First Chronicles. I've got two notebooks here, see? This is the one I want here. Uh, First Chronicles chapter 12. Uh, have you got it on the screen? No. First Chronicles chapter 12. There's a very, very interesting little verse in chapter 12, verse 32. It says, of the sons of Issachar, who had understanding of the times, to know what Israel ought to do. And it's really, this is, this is uh, uh, David's army, and, and he's talking about people from different tribes that were there, but uniquely it talks about the sons of Issachar, who had understanding of the times. Uh, I believe that it's extraordinarily relevant for us, actually, to have people amongst us who understand the times. And so may I give public recognition to people like Candace Owens and some people that have been speaking out publicly in the nation who grasp what's going on, uh, how in many ways things are being undermined. You know that there is a war going on in this country right now. It's a war against Christianity against family life in particular. And so in a variety of ways, we're seeing things enacted in, in, in politics, in local governments, in national governments, uh, in, in such a way as to, first of all, devalue family, and then to, to see if we can't just remove the influence of family life. And it's happening in a variety of different ways. Uh, I, I, I just want to uh, communicate a couple of things that are happening in our day that really illustrate this point. But let me go back to this. The sons of Issachar who had understanding of the times. Now the word understand, we understand, right? <laughs> it's not like a hard word. But this last week as I was preparing for this message, uh, I went to, to the, the uh, concordance that I have on some other words where understanding is used and, and I discovered it's, it's amazing how God wants us to, people, to be people who understand. We're not just floating through life not knowing what's going on, but actually to grasp what it is. His Word teaches us about getting understanding. And so I'm saying we need understanding in our day in order for us to know how. And, and here, it, here it says, it says they had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do. And so if I could put it into context today, what Christianity, what the Christians of America should do in this day. We need understanding. 
And, and I believe that God's given me at least a couple of little pieces that I want to add to so that we can grasp what's going on. Uh, in Isaiah 5.20, uh, it talks about a day of evil. And in that day of evil, it says, when good is evil and evil is good. And I remember reading that back when I was a youngster. Uh, and, and I grew up in a Christian home, and I, I had Bibles, and I, I, I read and found all these interesting verses in the Bible. By the way, if you, eh, let's see, who's under 20? All right, under 30. <laughs> I'll tell you what, if you study the Bible looking for interesting verses, there are so many really, really wild and crazy interesting verses, all right, just, just for the record. So if you haven't done it yet, you could, you could go there. Uh, but I remember reading that the time would come when evil would be called good and good would become evil. And, and I thought, well, that would be a really strange storyline. And here we are in this nation where we have had so much that has been positive. The founding fathers intended something that was so desirable that people from every corner of the world, their main goal is if somehow I could get to America where there is freedom, where Christianity is, is openly expressed. People want to come here, not only to see the Grand Canyon and, and a lot of other beautiful places, but the lifestyle of freedom that we have. And, and, and we've grown up with it and almost, well, I guess we probably took it for granted. Uh, but anyway, uh, we're living in a time, and, and may I add this little detail. In the Bible, God speaks about punishment, like the Babylonian captivity, uh, talks about when the Midianites were overrunning the Israelites. God is far more concerned about how Christians respond than he's worried about how the, co the countries that don't know about God, how they live. There's, there's not a lot, relatively speaking, of illustrations where God says, you know what, that nation was so nasty, I'm just going to really let them have it. Most of the time when the Bible speaks about punishment and dealing in discipline, it has to do with people of God that ought to know better people who have heard the truth and then walked away from it. That's the thing that really irks the heart of God in terms of discipline and punishment, all right? Uh, so we have said, I'm not the first one who said, uh, if God doesn't uh, deal in, in some level of punishment to America, he's going to, have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah, which is crazy sound, but the point is God in his word teaches us clearly that Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed with fire and brimstone just wiped out because of their blatant sexual immorality and homosexuality. And here we're living in a day in America where we have read that scripture, we understand what it is, and we not only really are embracing it as a culture, but I remember when Obama was saying, if you don't embrace it in African countries, we'll stop our financial support for you. I'm thinking, what? That we would literally, as a nation, try to promote ungodliness in other nations. Bad enough that we do it, but then to, to, to sell it to others as well. Well, anyway, uh, we're living in that kind of a day. Again, I've been a history student, and I, I, I have thoroughly enjoyed studying history. And I know that in my day, we had several of the most wicked leaders that have ever been around that I know of. Uh, Hitler in the, in the Second World War, uh, with, with such a brutal, horrible manner, uh, butchered off six million Jewish people for no reason other than that they were Jews. It's, it's, it was so bad that literally when the war was over, the United Nations got together and said, we need to find a homeland for the Jews because this, this is unacceptable. Six million. In the meantime, right after Hitler came Stalin, and he butchered off more than six billion people in Russia just to enforce his system. And if that wasn't bad enough, in China, Mao Zedong, in the 1950s and 60s, 60 million Chinese died for no reason other than he was going to implement his communistic system that, in that country, all right? We would say, vile, wicked, horrible, unbelievable. And here in this country of freedom and openness, we have seen over 60 million Babies murdered in a mother's womb. Unbelievable. Uh, are you getting what I'm saying? We are living in, in enormously uh, difficult times trying to figure out how to put these pieces together. And I'm saying 
We need people who understand the times and say, okay, God, what, what do we do now? Other than get on our knees and cry out to God. But beyond that, there are some things that can be, should be done. I'm going to get to that in a little bit. We're living in an age where not only is homosexuality exalted, transgender, and what I call it basically spitting in the face of God. Defiance of God, promoting a lifestyle that, that we, are, we know clearly would be just entirely anti-God. And then, of all things, coming to a time when preaching about sin and God's judgment is called hate speech. When the Son of God died for those sins and offers redemption, salvation, freedom. A few months ago, I read this article. President Biden wanted to cut off lunch money for schools if they didn't permit boys in girls' bathrooms. And I about fell over. I thought, I can't believe it. I mean, how completely ridiculous, uh, counterproductive. And we're living in a time that makes it very difficult because, in fact, the media and their efforts to spread disinformation, uh, creating a sense in which, you, you, you know, you, you wonder, okay, where do you watch the news to get an honest news report? I was an English teacher by trade, working with journalism, and I always thought that the job of school teachers was to teach genuine material and, and, and so on. That's what I was doing in schools. And the journalist's job was to report the truth, not turn everything into their angle and see if they can pound something into it. And, and we've got a media that, that isn't interested in the truth, but in promoting their agenda. Uh, it, it's a difficult time. Uh, we had a grandson living with us for a few months, and, uh, and we talked about some current events. And, uh, and I said to him, where do you get your news? Well, he pulled out his lab, pulled out his little <laughs> phone, and he says, "Well, I've got a connection here that's got Hollywood news, and they, they're the ones that tell me what's going on." <laughs> said, okay, well, <laughs> I see where you're going with that one. <laughs> no wonder you don't know what's going on. Uh, anyway, uh, we're living in a difficult, difficult time. Uh, when I came to the United States in 1964. Uh, they had just begun the process of removing prayer and Bible and God from the public schools. They went beyond that to take it out of government as much as they could. Uh, but for those who don't know, i got news for you. God never left. Right. <laughs> right. uh, in fact, um, as somebody said, and I know it's a bit of a joke, but that's also part of the reality. Uh, as long as there are tests and exams in school, there will be prayer. <laughs> Just say it. You, know. uh, you, you, you cannot, and they've tried, you cannot legislate God out, and you cannot legislate God's heart for people out, because God is far bigger than that, number one. Uh, and secondly, uh, he, it, you just simply can't, you can't remove him no matter what you do. Uh, William Booth, how many know who William Booth was? You got it? Who's William Booth? Salvation Army. In 1899, that would be one year before 1900, okay? In 1899, William Booth predicted... Uh, saying the principal danger of the 20th century, which is the 1900s, and so we're already past that century, the principal danger of the 20th century will be a religion without the Holy Spirit. Christians without Christ. Forgiveness without repentance. Uh, and he didn't say uh, borrowing money to go to college and then get it forgiven. Didn't mention that one. He didn't think it would ever go there. <laughs> All right. Salvation without regeneration. And then I thought, what an interesting comment. Politics without God. Now, maybe you grew up in a Mennonite community where they thought politics and God shouldn't be in the same room anyway. But th the fact of the matter is, historically in the Western world, Politics in all the European countries, and especially in the United States, 
God was right at the heart of politics. The way that founding fathers designed it all, God was right, Amen. integral. In fact, one of the founding fathers says, this, this uh, uh, democracy that we have here cannot stand without Christians being in power. Because, he said, unless we recognize that we're answerable to God, you can't make enough rules to make everything work. But if we understand that we're answerable to God, then you don't have to make all kinds of rules to tell you how to do it, because God will restrain you. You try to remove the restraints and take God out of politics, and you've got what we've got, a mess. He also said, they will be teaching heaven without hell. Let me be very clear. If there was not a hell, then our message would be just a casual conversation. There are those who think, well, everybody's going to go to heaven. It's strange that they don't really believe in God, but they do want to believe in heaven. So, the man was right. Do your duty, vote. Uh, let me turn the page. Talking about trusting God in uncertain times is always difficult. There is a tension. Okay, you know what the word tension is. There's a tension between two factors, trusting God and acting to defend or to stand up for whatever. Because trusting God can happen quietly at home without saying anything. When do we stand up and do something? And we've already been saying, in this country we have the privilege of voting, so that's a good one. There are also things we can do. We can promote things. May I be very candid and say, uh, up where we live in the Indianapolis area, uh, the city that we live in, there are people running for the school board. And you know what? The people on the, on the ballots for school board used to be a casual, incidental thing. You didn't pay much attention because everybody basically felt the same way about it. We want good schools. We want good teachers. We want kids to behave themselves. We want things to go well in the schools. Don't, and, and, and thank you for voting, for being on the school board. That's good. We need some people at that. And when you get your term done, somebody else will do it. It's all good. And nobody pays attention to who they are. Now it's very critical because the schools are part of the implementation of the devil's plan. Not Biden's plan, but the devil's plan to undermine all of our, our, our traditions and our morals and our values. Yep. And so it becomes critical. And so by the grace of God, my wife and I got some notes from people and said, all right, these are the six people running for office and these are the three people. And if you don't know what the word woke is, I can explain that to you. But it's going on in our culture and it's the effort to put people in who are not qualified to tell us how we're supposed to do things. Anyway, the re reality is we actually needed help because I didn't know the people running, but to know who's, who favors a, a lifestyle that we want to promote, you know, all the bad stuff and who's, who wants to have things done in an orderly fashion. So I was grateful for that. Um, years ago, I was involved with some people who, on, on elections, they, they, they sent out what do you call those papers that tell, okay, here are the people running for office. This is what this guy stands for. This is what this guy stands for. So we had, we had some charts because we don't know very many things about what they, what they really believe. Uh, so I appreciate the people who've done that kind of work. Uh, in Ezekiel chapter um, 3, Ezekiel chapter 3, how many of you know where Ezekiel is? I don't mean him as a person. I'm talking about the Bible <laughs> chapter. <laughs> he's, he's hiding in the back room. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Uh, Ezekiel chapter 3 tells us a very, very somber, somber word. May I preface this by saying, this is the word of the Lord to Ezekiel. And how many of you are called Ezekiel? Got any Ezekiels here? You got one? That's good. You're easy. Okay. Uh, anyway, uh, this is a word to Ezekiel, and, and not everybody should say, okay, that's God's word to me personally, but this is the principle of God coming forth from God to Ezekiel, and he says in verse 17, Son of man, I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. 
All right? I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. Therefore, hear a word from my mouth and give them warning from me. Then he says, when I say to the wicked, you shall surely die because of their wicked behavior. When I say to the wicked, you shall surely die, and you give him no warning. Don't speak any word to warn the wicked from his wicked ways to save his life. That same wicked man will die in his iniquity. And then what does it say? But his blood I will require at your hand. But if you warn the wicked, and he does not turn from his wickedness nor from his wicked ways, he will die in his iniquity, but you have delivered your soul. I believe that the church, the people of God, have a voice to leaders in our, in our communities and to our nation, to people. And our voice should be a voice of warning to wickedness. There are many other things that we should say, but the point is there's a real sense in which the church is a conscience to the public life. And so when Christians have the freedom to speak out and warn people about wrong things, about judgment coming, this is the right thing to do. Uh, goes on to say, when a righteous man turns from his righteousness and commits iniquity, in other words, a backslider, somebody that was actually doing well, and he somehow wavers, and he goes into things that aren't right. And I lay a stumbling block before him, he shall die, because you did not give him warning. He'll die in his sin, and his righteousness shall be, he shall die. And his righteousness, which he has done, shall not be remembered. But his blood I'll require at your hand. Nevertheless, if you warn the righteous man that the righteous should not sin, and he does not sin, he shall surely live, because you took warning. He took warning. Also, you will have delivered your soul. The Scripture simply implies one of the things that I believe in, that God wants us to be salt and light, and we are to influence our culture. Amen. Our lifestyle, the words we speak, letters to the editor, a variety of ways. And may I say, while we're here, and I'm not trying to throw dirt at all the politicians, I am here to say that there are in fact some really amazing men and women of God who are standing up publicly speaking out about right, right stuff, decency, uh, common sense, godliness, and they're speaking out in the public arenas and I appreciate them very much. There are a lot of politicians who aren't there, but there are a lot who are. And you probably know some of them. And I thank God for every one of those that speaks out that God has given a public platform to, to speak out. And then God gives some people, literally, a platform to speak to the nation. And I, I thank God for people who actually spoke out. There was a time when David Wilkerson uh, had, a, had a public voice because his work of the Teen Challenge in New York City with the gangs uh, was so significant that it actually created a platform and he was able to speak out to the nation about where we could and should go and what's, what's, what's wrong and so on. God has given other voices. Billy Graham had a voice to the nations in incredible ways and many of us will never have that kind of a platform. But wherever we do, uh, God doesn't ask you to be Billy Graham. God asks you to be faithful to where you are. Maybe your voice is to Elkhart County. Maybe your voice is to Bristol. Maybe your voice is to uh, a certain segment, whatever it is, salt and light, influencing the culture we live in. Amen? All right. Uh, so, a conscience to the nation. Uh, let me now go to the heart of what I think God is wanting to say to us, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to basically uh, hub this out of Psalm 37. Got other sections to the Scriptures as well. Um, one preacher once said, if you get done before I get done, you can leave. Uh, but I, I won't say that. Um, if you get done before I get done, you might stand up and stretch a little bit, and I'll say, oh, I better hurry up. Um, all right. Psalm 37, and beginning with verse 3. <clears throat> Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. He shall bring forth your righteousness as the light, 
and your justice as the noonday. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret. How many of you use the word fret once in a while? How many have never used it other than reading the Bible? How many have never used the word fret? You know what that is? What's the word fret mean? Worried. Worried, yeah. Inner sense of not quite subtleness, all right? Uh, no, don't fret because of him who prospers in his way, because of the man who brings wicked schemes to pass. Cease from anger. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. wrath. Whew. Yesterday I was meeting with some missionaries and we were reminiscing a little bit about something. And I remember asking or making this comment that some about a year or two ago I asked a friend, if you were not a Christian, how would your life be different? You're living in America. You know, we live maybe like many other people. If you were not a Christian, how would you be different? She said, I'd be more angry. <laughs> and I thought, well, that is, that is a really, really amazingly straightforward statement. Because what she was really saying is, I know enough about what's going on. I could spend my whole life just venting my anger at stuff that's happening. As Christians, I, I have a restraint because I know that the wicked will be wicked and I can't straighten all that out. I'm not responsible for all of it, but I am responsible for my responses and I can't just continue on in anger, right? And so when he says here, cease from anger and forsake wrath, um, it reminds me back when I was a teenager and I was I was already sort of preaching when I was there. Uh, I remember that book of James where it says, the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. All right? Let's say it together. The wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. One more time. The wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Um, I thought it was pretty significant because uh, I, I'm a kind of a passionate person and, and, and I, sometimes I want to get my point through. Um, and, and so God was teaching me that anger and wrath don't produce what God's after. So here he says, forsake wrath. And then he says it again, don't fret. And then what comes after that? It only causes harm. Okay, looking at these verses from 3 through 8, I, I just want to spend a little time there. Um, and on my topic of asking God, okay, how do we handle tension between trusting God and action and so on? And, and here in the first line of verse 3, it says, trust in the Lord and do good. In other words, while you're trusting the Lord, go about doing Right? Action. What kind of action? Do good. Um, for instance, while the nation is in fury and uproar and tension and divisive and all that stuff, say a nice thing to your neighbor. Uh, I remember when my wife, you know, every once in a while she, she makes good things to eat. And we got a neighbor that is not a churchgoer. So she made some stuff. I brought it over to him. Do good. Because, and he knows I'm a Christian. I'm, 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 I'm telling him. In fact, I, I said, look, look, buddy, uh, you, you've lived well over half of your life. You're not going to be around all that much longer. And when you die, it's either heaven or hell. You really need to get it settled now because this is the only time you get the choice. Um, and and uh, by the way, I'm going to continue to preach that because I believe it. Amen. If I didn't believe there was a hell, I wouldn't be nearly as concerned about those matters. So, Trust in the Lord and do good. Find ways to do good, uh, which is different from trust in the Lord and argue with the guys that aren't doing, <laughs> doing it the way you want it. That's not what he says, right? Uh, trust in the Lord and, and go about that the fruit of your life would actually move toward a healthier community where you live. Be, be an influence where you live for, for righteousness. Uh, and then it goes on to say, Delight yourself in the Lord. And uh, by the way, it says, delight yourself in the Lord and 
He will give you the desires of your heart. How many read that verse before? Okay, how many had never heard that? Okay, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the, the desires of your heart. Uh, how many actually believe that? Okay, how many aren't sure what, what does that mean? Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Okay, for those of you who have trouble with that because you got some desires and they haven't, they haven't been coming out the right way. How many, ever, how many of you ever wanted something and it didn't happen? <laughs> how many have never had that happen to you? <laughs> Liars. <laughs> <laughs> We have a lot of things happening that don't go the way we want them. Let's face it, right? Okay, so what could he possibly mean when he says, delight yourself in the Lord and he'll give you the desires of your heart? And he didn't say, and he'll give you the desires of your heart. No, <laughs> that's not what it says. Uh, let me try to put it into focus for you. And this ministers to me, and you might say, you're a bit strange. That's okay. If you delight yourself in the Lord, which would be things like worshiping Him, and I used to play guitar, and I'd sing to the Lord and, and read His Word and share about God and, and, and just and so on. Uh, I, I, I believe in delight yourself in the Lord. And then how about that? He'll give you the desire of your heart. And, and I discovered this. When you delight yourself in the Lord, God begins to put desires in you that are from God. Yes. Delight yourself in the Lord and God will put desires in you that please Him. It's not like He'll delight yourself in the Lord and He'll give you that ham sandwich. No. <laughs> delight yourself in the Lord and He will put in you desires that He has and then He will lead you into it and you go back and say, you know what? I remember when I really wanted that and it happened. Well, <laughs> that's how it happened. God put the desire in you, and then he began to bring it about. Uh, you got a comment on this one? Or just blessing the Lord with me? Amen, amen. Uh, I was a school teacher, you know, when somebody raises their hand, I'm thinking, okay, I should <laughs> pay attention to it. So you can all raise your hand and worship God. All right. <laughs> uh, yes. Anyway, that's not a small thing. This little verse that I just shared with you, I, I believe this is very, very significant. It has been in my life. I, I really genuinely find myself rejoicing in God because God has done so many wonderful things that, that God put the desire in me and then it began to happen. I think, wow, I get to live to see it. Glory to God. All right. Then it says, after you commit yourself to the Lord, or rather, as, as you delight yourself in the Lord, then commit your way to the Lord Trust in him, and he'll bring it to pass. Glory to God. Rest in the Lord. Why am I spending time in these verses? Because day after tomorrow is election, and I want you to rest in the Lord. I want you to delight in the Lord. I want you to trust in the Lord and do good. I'm telling you what, I, I don't care how this thing will turn out, Wednesday and Thursday, I plan to have a good day. Because God never changes. And he's going to be with me, whatever's going on. May I, may I, okay, this one I'll say, and you can say, okay, that's not in the Bible, and he's just a strange guy. But I believe that God can and will give us some really good, godly people in office. I also believe that when God doesn't, it's because he knows what's going on and we actually get what we deserve. Amen. Amen. And that's the hard part. When we get wicked leaders, it's because we deserve it. One of them, either we didn't vote or because we actually as a nation have so followed after foolishness that God says, enough of that. And so either way, God is at work. Whether we get all of our wishes in the election or very few of them, God sees it all. And he knows where we are and whether we are deserving of some reward or deserving of some judgment or whatever it is, God sees it. 
And so that's why I can tell you right now, as you approach Tuesday, rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Don't fret. Don't fret, even if some people get voted in and you know how wicked their intent is. Don't fret. God didn't lose control. It's not the end of the story. Like somebody once said, when the devil reminds you of your past, you remind him of his future. Don't fret. Cease from anger. Forsake wrath. And so as we prepare ourselves for Tuesday, I want us to actually grasp this whole thing. I'm trusting God and doing good. By voting, by sharing, salt and light, everything we can. When it's all said and done, we're going to trust God. All right, very quickly then, uh, i got to wrap this up here. Proverbs chapter 3. Uh, and some of you, like me, went to summer Bible camps, and you probably memorized verses like I did. Um, Proverbs chapter 3 has a verse that's been very special. Verse 5 and 6, trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. I believe that one of the ways to experience the hand of God is acknowledging him. When things happen which were so different from what you anticipated, acknowledge God. God's in it. Okay, God's, what do you, what do you got for me? This is, this is a special day today. You brought something to us. We, my wife and I were preparing dinner last night. I was grilling chicken, and I got a phone call from Ruth Ann's sister, whose house we were staying at, and she said, we got some missionary friends that are around in their houses without power. And so I invited them to come over and eat dinner with us. So keep the chicken grilling and get the house ready because we got company coming. In all your ways, acknowledge him. And you know what? We had a great time enjoying fellowship with sweet, precious saints of God. In all your ways, acknowledge him. It may not go your way, but I'll tell you what. You can fret or you can say, hey, God's in control. And it'll bring rest to your spirit, to your soul. Hallelujah. Uh, okay, for my, uh, the book of Mark, chapter 10, uh, has the story. How, how many of you remember the story of the rich young ruler? Remember that? Yeah. It was a, a rich young ruler, which means he was, he was wealthy, inherited wealth, no doubt, because he was a ruler and he was young, so he hadn't built his company he had, but he was wealthy, property, land, whatever he had. And uh, he comes to Jesus and, and says, uh, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Okay, so Jesus talks to him about it. Then, then we read in verse 23, Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it is for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of heaven. And the disciples were astonished at his words, but Jesus answered again and said, children, how hard it is for those who trust in riches to enter the kingdom of God. Got it? How hard it is for those who trust in riches to enter the kingdom of God. How many believe being rich is a sin? Good, good. I don't either. But when I was in India, not one of the poorest countries in the world. I was in India, and I saw a sign on the wall. I've been rich. I've been poor. Rich is better. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, of all places here in, in Calcutta, which is one of the hell holes of the world, <laughs> and to get a sign like that. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, riches is not the sin. Trusting in riches is a problem, Right? So when we're talking about trusting in riches, we're talking about houses and lands and property and stocks and uh, uh, money in the bank, whatever it is, trusting in riches. And do you know that we in this country have been wealthy compared with most of the world? Do you know that I don't have much, but I'm one of the wealthiest people in the world? <laughs> uh, I mean, don't push too hard on that one. I, <laughs> it's not like we have all that much. <laughs> Um, but 
we actually have a house that's paid for and a car that's paid for and I haven't missed a payment ever. Now, how many people in the world are on that standard? Okay, okay, just, just saying. Uh, it's hard for those who trust in riches to enter the kingdom of God. And you probably do like I did when I first read verses like that. I always equate the kingdom of God is heaven. And that's not necessarily wrong. But I read in Romans chapter 14, the kingdom of God is not meat and drink. But what is it? Righteousness, peace, and joy. Righteousness, peace, and joy. How hard it is for those who trust in riches to have righteousness, peace, and joy. Does that make sense? Are you tracking with me? For those who trust in riches, it's very hard for them to experience the sense of righteousness because they're not at peace. They've got to protect what they've got. Check the stock market every day, see what's happening with my property. Uh, build bigger fences so nobody steals what I've got. Uh, spend all night hardly sleeping because somebody might take away or the stock market might take it away. By the way, Biden's robbed me of quite a few thousands of dollars. But I'm not spending time getting mad at him because my trust is in God and it's not in my stock market. All right? How hard it is for people who, and, and this guy did. He had property, he had everything. I've thought about that. Jesus was inviting him into the most inner circle there has ever been on planet Earth to be part of a core of disciples walking with the Son of God whose name would be spoken of for centuries of his faithfulness to serve God. And Jesus was inviting him, look, leave your property, sell it all, come follow me. Now, for those of us who don't have a whole lot, we could sell it and go with Jesus, but this guy had a lot, and he didn't do it. He missed the opportunity. Those who trust in riches have a hard time entering into righteousness and peace and joy. I heard somebody say recently about a man who, who had become quite wealthy. <laughs> and, and, and the friend said, do you remember before you had that? Weren't you quite a bit happier than you are now? <laughs> and it's a reality. Um, there's nothing wrong with, with riches, but it can rob you of a lot of joy and peace. And righteousness means right relationships with God and right relationships with people around you. And God wants us to have that. And when we're clutching to our properties, we're not really free to have that kind of thing at all. All right. Trusting God in Biden times. Trusting God in election times. Trusting God in a difficult time in America. So to conclude, I'd like to completely blow you away with Hebrews chapter 13. Uh, there's a verse, <laughs> there's two verses in the book of Hebrews that in the Amplified make a couple pages. Um, and uh, I just enjoy this so much. Uh, so uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the normal Bible, it just says, let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with what th such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what can man do to me. And I remember reading that verse, and, and, and I've said this many times. One of the greatest promises of God is he said, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I will be with you. Through thick and thin, I'll be there. So if you can put Hebrews 13 verses 5 and 6 on a board. I want you to look at that with me. And, and, and don't get worn out. This is pretty long. All right? Let your character or moral disposition be free from the love of money. 
including greed, avarice, lust, craving for earthly possessions, okay? So let your character, your moral disposition be free from that stuff. And be satisfied with your present circumstances and with what you have. Ooh, uh, how many would like to say, Lord, I think I need a little help with that one. <laughs> be, um, be satisfied with, what, with your present circumstances with what you have. For he, God, himself has said, isn't that interesting? He, God himself, uh, has said, I will not in any way fail you, nor give you up, nor leave you without support. I will not, I will not, I will not in any degree leave you helpless, nor forsake, nor let you down, or relax my hold on you. Assuredly not. And if you don't know what the Amplified Bible is, it's not somebody that falls asleep and then keeps saying it over and over. <laughs> it's actually um, every translation people choose, okay, this word in the Hebrew or in the Greek is this in English. And, and you'd say, you know, what? It's, it's more than just that. It's also this and it's a little that. So the Amplified actually gives you several words that are complementary to what the word is. And the interesting thing is that last part where he says, I will not, I will not, I will not in any way. That's not the writer falling asleep and then saying it again. That's actually to emphasize the fact that in the, in the Greek language, it is so emphatic that you want to say it, I will not, I will not, I will not, I will not in any way. Are you tracking with me? I will not leave you. I will not forsake you. I will be with you. That's why I say, whatever happens on Tuesday, Wednesday we'll be fine. Yeah. And so then he says in verse, mm, verse 6, yes, 6 up there, yeah. So we take comfort and are encouraged and confidently and boldly say, the Lord is my helper. Why don't we stand and read that together? Let's, let's just stand and read that together. I'll, I'll lead you and so you can, you can go with me. So we take comfort... Come on. And are encouraged and confidently and boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not be seized with alarm. I will not fear or dread or be terrified. What can man do to me? Amen. Amen. May the Lord bless you and may we grow because that's what it is. Trust is something that grows. You don't start off with mature trust. That comes through experiences and finding out. There was a song that we had uh, that our two sons sent us a song, one from Virginia and one from Australia, the same song within a few minutes of each other, sent us a song and, and the line says, I don't know what you're up to or what you're doing, but I do know what you've done. And because we know what he's done, we have confidence in the present when we don't know what in the world's going on. God has not lost control. Amen. Amen. Lord, we thank you. And we want to say, Lord, we trust you. In the name of Jesus. Amen.